Hi, welcome to Topics in Teaching and Learning, brought to you by the Learning Academy. Today's topic is backwards course design. This brief overview will cover the basics, what it is, how to go about it, as well as why you might want to use it. Before we get started, consider this scenario. A friend asks you for help in planning her next vacation. Should she go to Paris to climb the Eiffel Tower, enjoy the famous art museums and tour historic churches, or Hawaii to lay on the beach, swim with sea turtles, and do yoga in the mountains? Maybe you're thinking, well, those are two very different destinations that involve very different activities. What does my friend want out of this vacation? If so, you've got the premise of backwards design. To plan well, begin with the end in mind. Ask yourself a couple of questions. What serves as the inspiration for my design when I'm building a course? Is it the way you were taught when you took a similar class as a student? What's the first decision I make when I'm designing a course? Is it the textbook or the readings you'll use? Is it the content you'll cover? Is it how many exams or papers you'll assign? Or maybe it's how to make each class session interesting and interactive. Each of these is an important design decision, but each should depend on the answers to this question. What do I want my students to know or be able to do after taking my course? In their book, Understanding by Design, Wiggins and McTie say that when teachers are designing lessons, units, or courses, they often focus on the activities of instruction rather than the outputs of instruction. They argue that our lessons, units, and courses should be logically inferred from the results sought, not derived from the methods, books, and activities with which we are most comfortable. You might have guessed by now, this is the first step of backwards design. Articulate your desired results or learning goals. For example, a learning outcome for a course in persuasion might be written as such. Students will be able to apply rhetorical theory to critically evaluate persuasive artifacts. The instructor might have a secondary goal of helping students develop their writing skills. For a calculus class, a learning outcome might be that students will be able to analyze functions using limits, derivatives, and integrals. A secondary goal might be that they develop an appreciation for calculus. As you can imagine, some goals, like the secondary one, may not be formally assessed, but still guide decisions about teaching and learning. It's actually important to write out your goals for students in a course. This way you can ensure clarity and continually refer to them as the anchor for all other course and class design decisions. Once you've got your goals to guide you, step two of backwards course design is to determine what students will do to demonstrate that they've achieved those goals. In other words, what kind of assessments, formative and summative, will you use? It might seem a bit out of sequence to determine assessments before you determine how students will actually learn what you want them to know. But getting clear on what successful student performance looks like relative to your goals actually makes it easier to develop targeted learning activities. Dr. Pamela Marshall, a professor of biology at ASU, attests to this approach. She says, focusing on the desired result first requires me to think about how students can demonstrate their understanding of science, meaning what are the pieces of evidence that students can use to show that they understand the content. This allows me to expand my assessment approaches in science. Let's continue with our example. Remember the first goal of the course in persuasion. Students will be able to apply rhetorical theory to critically evaluate persuasive artifacts. Consider how students might demonstrate that they've learned to do so. They could choose a persuasive artifact and write an analytical paper. They could analyze artifacts by way of short written homework assignments. They could demonstrate this through an essay or a short answer question on an exam. Or they could give oral presentations in which they discuss their analyses of artifacts. Any of these would be good opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning. However, remember that we had a secondary goal for the persuasion course, which was to help students improve their writing skills. So it makes sense to favor written assessments over oral ones. Again, it's a best practice to write down your plans for assessments and to do so beside the corresponding learning goals. This provides a visual check for alignment and allows you to reference the specifics as you build out the rest of the course. Now we've got learning assessments aligned well to our learning goals which means we're well on our way to designing a learning-centered course. This brings us to step three of backwards course design. Determine learning activities and methods of instruction. 
Sometimes you might be tempted to begin with this step, thinking first about what students will read or how you'll teach the material, but saving these decisions for much later in the course design process is a better choice because what the students and instructor will do can be guided purposefully by the learning goals and the ways student work will be assessed. Let's get back to our example of a persuasion course. If students will demonstrate their knowledge through open-ended exam questions and analytical essays, then what kinds of activities should they be doing before, during, and after each class such that they are achieving the learning goals and getting the chance to practice demonstrating their knowledge in ways that will prepare them for success on assessments? How about having them do some in-class written analysis of persuasive artifacts once a rhetorical theory has been introduced? That would be a nice way for them to practice applying their knowledge in writing and would serve as a great catalyst for class discussions. And don't forget to write it down. Now, some instructors might think that aligning learning activities with assessments constitutes handholding. You might have heard the saying, teaching to the test, as a derogatory description of this. But why shouldn't learning activities be aligned with assessments? For example, consider a teenager who is trying to get his driver's license. If, as his instructor, you've only ever asked him to explain orally how to drive rather than having him actually drive a car, you haven't prepared him for success on the driving test. It seems more pedagogically sound for him to drive a car at some point in his learning process. So to recap, the three steps of backwards design are determine learning goals, determine learning assessments, and determine learning activities, importantly ensuring alignment along the way. We've now covered what backwards design is and how to go about it. In case it's not already obvious, here are a few reasons why you might want to take this approach. When you begin with learning goals, you will design assessments and activities that are learning-centered as opposed to teaching-centered. In other words, the focus is moved from what the instructor does before, during, and after class to what the students will do before, during, and after class. There's evidence that students have better experiences when their courses are designed this way. After taking learning-centered courses, students have shown, for example, improved self-efficacy, higher satisfaction with learning experiences, improved performance on key assessments, and higher achievement on learning outcomes. Plus, backwards design can lead to a better experience for instructors. In case you missed it, backwards design facilitates alignment among your learning goals, learning assessments, and learning activities. One benefit of this is a sharper focus on content that's most important for students to learn. This really helps you to think about essential concepts and essential questions rather than just content coverage. Another benefit of backwards design is that it facilitates expanded or even novel approaches to assessments and learning activities. When you stop to ask yourself, how can students learn this or demonstrate their learning? You're less likely to stick with the way you've always done things. Ultimately, all of this can lead to a sense of more purposeful teaching. Who doesn't want that? To sum up, if we design courses with targets in mind, we're more likely to hit the mark. That's backwards design in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed this overview. You can find additional resources on this topic and a teaching task template for backwards design on the Learning Academy website. Join me for another topic in teaching and learning soon. See you next time.